Wow. The full story behind the video we just watched, it's beyond anything we could have dreamed. It's completely beyond anything we could have done on our own. It is sincerely God's story birthing Calvary and the life of Calvary Community Church. It's amazing. Good morning. My name is Jason McMaster. I have the joy and privilege of serving as the executive pastor here at Calvary. This is a very special morning, and it's an honor as we celebrate God's faithfulness, his provision, his doing more than we could ever think or imagine. As Michael Field shared earlier, he and I both grew up here at Calvary. This is a very significant moment in the life of our church as we have our founding pastor, Larry DeWitt, here with us, our current senior pastor, Sean Thornton, and our future senior pastor, Brian Howard, three remarkable generations of ministry impact for the Lord all together here. This morning, we're going to talk about what he has done, but we're also going to talk about what God has done in and through each one of you impacting lives for Jesus. Pastor Larry, you've had a tremendous impact on so many people. In, during your 27 years pastoring here at Calvary, you had a tremendous impact on me and my wife, Jenny. Uh, my family and I, we started coming to Calvary when I was 10 years old. My parents said, we're going to go to a church in a warehouse. I thought that sounded kind of cool. It was different. And so we came, and the church didn't have a parking lot. And it didn't have know, a couple bathrooms. It was interesting with like 900 people in it every weekend. And, and it grew, and it kept growing. And God used you to impact thousands of people with the good news of Jesus in the Caneo Valley. It's remarkable. You impacted my life. And it was in college that I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ and I decided I wanted to get baptized and publicly declare that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. And back then, you had to share our testimony in front of everybody. There wasn't some really nice edited video. Mark and Tricia Davis weren't here to read the cool story. You had to get up and share it. And I remember after that, you came outside And you came up to my family, and you met with me, and you looked me right in the eyes, and I'll I'll never forget it. You said, one day, you're going to be a pastor. What I thought you didn't know was I was in college at UCLA at the time studying to get a degree in medicine. What I didn't know at the time was God had other plans for my life. It's incredible. And not just a couple years later, I accepted a role as an, with an internship here at Calvary Community Church in the middle school ministry. And it was on that first day that I met my future wife, Jenny. She was also interning here at Calvary. Mm. And shortly after that, you took all of us as a church to Israel. And I asked Jen to marry me on the Mediterranean Sea. And you have been a part of all of those significant milestones in my life. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And I know you and I were talking about this. There are hundreds of people that we know that you helped launch into ministry and thousands of people that we know that you've shared Christ with. It's incredible. And so I want to ask the congregation, if you were here back on Skyline in the A-frame building, or off Moore Park Road near Los Los Robles Golf Course at the Hungry Tiger, or you were at the warehouse where we were with the no parking lot, or any part of the time when Pastor Larry was our senior pastor, will you please stand? Come on. That's me too. And I know there's a season when you retired, and God had an interim plan, and we had some ups and downs, but in God's providence, he brought us Pastor Sean Thornton, an incredible blessing to our church, an incredible leader, and 
wonderful friend and mentor in my life. If you came after Larry, but before 2020, we'll get to that in a minute. So after Larry, but before 2020, would you please stand if you came to Calvary during that season? Thank you. That means the rest of you are standing next. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so if you came post-2020, because God uses other things, and I think he used the pandemic, and he used other things happening where people started stirring for truth and meaning in life. So if you came to Calvary, or if today is your first, very first day, welcome. We would love for you to stand at post-2020 when you came to Calvary Community Church. <laughs> wow. a third of the room on each one. It's amazing. Larry, I can't believe it was 25 years ago. 1999, I was there. I remember we were dancing, singing, waving palm branches as we marched from the warehouse to this building. It has to be more than you could ever have hoped, imagined, or dreamed. The theme verse this morning is Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I know that verse is very significant to you and even in this room. Can you share? It begins with now he is able. It's not your ability or mine. Mm -hmm. Get that. It's not my ability to do the right thing or yours. To do more, no, no, immeasurably more, a whole lot more than what? What have you dreamed? What have you asked for? Beyond all of that, he does it through what? His power, mm. the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. To him, and where does that lead? Is it work in us to give the glory to Jesus Christ? To him be the glory to Jesus Christ and in Calvary Community Church. Mm throughout this generation and the next generations. That's what that means. And that means so much to me that that scripture was planted by me right there where the X is. You're almost sitting on it. Go ahead. And where you stand every week to preach as a reminder to why we're here and what God wants to do. And it ain't based on our ability. It's based on his incredibility. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's what it means. Amen. 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 So good. So I know early on you were in ministry in Fort Wayne, Indiana, but God had other plans for your life as well. Can you share a little bit more about the journey God took you and Becky on that brought you ultimately to being the senior pastor here at Calvary? Have you ever had the feeling you've sort of got your life together now? Every once in a while somebody says, I think I get it together. Well, I think we had our life together when I was about 40 and uh, we were living in Fort Wayne, as you said. I was pastor of a very historic church had the oldest radio broadcast in America, had that every Sunday morning, and uh, it was growing like crazy, a lot of growth. We were well paid. We had a wonderful new, beautiful house to live in, car, everything was taken care of. Our kids were in a Christian school, it was all going great. And I looked out on this congregation, I had a couple hundred college kids who were there because the college was across the street. And I looked at the adults who were there and realized that there was a missing generation. From 25 to 45 or so, there wasn't much there. And I stopped and thought about this, why? What was the phenomenon that was going on then and going on now? Mm. That people just marginalized, oh, I don't, what's not worth it? When I've asked people why they didn't go to church, they say, well, I used to, but I get boring. Or I really didn't get that much out of it. Or after a while, I just, I have better things to do with my life. And I was brokenhearted, as I am today, to see a generation of people growing up who miss the significance that all of life is based on who Jesus Christ is to us. And I was so passionate about that, and at Fuller Seminary, where I'd gone to school, they were starting something new in America, which based on some missionaries who came back and said, We've, something's got to happen to change this, and they call it the church growth movement. Mm -hmm. Well, I was on the ground floor of all of that, and really, Calvary was the first church that came out of that to say, what needs to change? 
how can we do church differently so that people are impacted all ages and generations? And that was, that was the backdrop to how this happened here. So one day I get a phone call mm -hmm. from somebody named Larry Parks, whose birthday is today, mm -hmm. going to be with the Lord now. And he said, uh, we were just at a church girl seminar in the mountains, some people from our church, and uh, we mentioned them mentioned to them who we were, and they said, there's a guy in the missionary church that we know that's studying with us, and they, his name's Larry DeWitt. So he called me, he said, that's why I called you. And he said, well, I just wonder if you'd be, he was so tactful in how he said things. <laughs> he just said, well, I was wondering if you'd consider leaving the church you're in and coming being our pastor. I mean, well, what? That's what he said to me, he really did. And I said, tell me something about the church. He said, well, we used to be 120, and now we're down to about 60 or 50, and it's just going the wrong direction. Said, yeah, right. Uh-huh. Why would I want you? Are you out of your mind? I mean, why, what, why would, what, does, does it make any sense to you? Do the math on that. What do you think? And then he said, uh, but we're believing that God wants to do something new in Canal Valley to bring a lot of people to Jesus. Mm. And I hung up and said, thank you. I said, wow, that was, wow. And I couldn't get away from The next four nights, I couldn't get away from that. And I called back and said, well, I put a compromise in my mind. I said, we would be glad to come out for a weekend and spend some time with you and talk about what, what these principles are that change a church and uh, help you with that, consult with you, you know? And so we did that. And at the end of that time, they wrote down all these things, and Linda Hoover wrote down this list of 13 or whatever it was, things we talked about that needed to be different if you're gonna reach a generation today. Uh, and then they said, we've decided we'd like to ask you to come and do it. Well, that's a different story, you know? <laughs> and we were at Larry Parks' house, Sally Parks' house. We get up in the morning, I was halfway through shaving, and I stopped, I used to shave back. Okay, no, never mind, <laughs> don't leave that alone. Uh, I, I came out to Becky and said, she said, what's up? I, I feel like God will do more in the next 20 years if we come here than if we stay where we are. And she looked at me with no hesitation and said, well, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this or not, but I have a feeling that women are stronger than men. <laughs> men don't want to admit that, but I mean, I mean consider a childbirth with a not, you know, but never mind, okay. But I believe that. And Becky just had the courage to say, we're here, everything's going well, our family's going well, fine, we'll start over. So we were owned by the system there. The car went away, the house went away, the money went away. We came out, people said, what are they gonna pay you? I said, we, we don't know, we're, we're gonna live. We don't know, we don't. So we had a trailer, put it behind an old Mercury that we bought and headed for California. They didn't even have a farewell for us. At the church, they were gonna have a farewell Sunday afternoon to say goodbye to us. And uh, it snowed that weekend. Nobody could go any place, it was snowed in. And so we had a wonderful farewell, yeah. And the next morning, some neighbors helped us push the car around the corner and got on the, on the road, and we headed south. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, how we came. And we came here with a great dream that God was gonna do something so incredible that it would change the next generation. And that's what the whole church growth thing was about. And uh, when we came and started, it exploded. I mean, people started to come. People came who wouldn't go to a church, they came to, to, to this place. Mm -hmm. And it started to explode. It just more and more people met the Lord. I came to a place where I said, Acts says, and the Lord added daily to the church those who were making, I said, we got to believe for 350, 400 people to meet Christ every, why not? And we did, and it usually happened, I think most years. But that's sort of how it came. And out of that, the thing caught fire. Christian magazines wrote some articles about it. Some others were doing it too. And then uh, the day came that I got a call from, guess what, what did they tell you? Oh, Wall, Wall, Street. Wall, Street Wall, Street Wall Street Journal? Yeah. You're kidding. Wall Street Journal called and said, uh, are, is it true that there are boomers meeting the Lord and coming, doing this thing of faith at the church? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. They sent a team out here to look at it. said, can't believe it. They came out here and spent a weekend with us and said, yeah, it really is. And they wrote an article about that. Yeah. And that caught fire too. But the whole idea that the church has to change the way it does things, its vocabulary and other things, the gospel doesn't change. But people change, and the way we relate to people has to change. And that's what this was all about. Yeah. So that was the basis of all of that happening. And look, you're here today because we dared to believe a dream, and it was his dream. 
Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Uh, so I know that Dr. Larry Parks and Sally had a tremendous impact in bringing uh, you here, and I understand they also mortgaged their home. That was the faith well, step they took. Well, to these couples it. that were here starting, I was going to go into the board and resign and say I was leaving the church in... Uh, the one in Fort Wayne. In Fort Wayne, yep. not here. No, the church yes. in Fort Wayne. And, uh, and I got a call from Larry Parks just before the meeting. I think he was, it was very timely. He said, well, we've just met with the other five families we have to start the church. We're all willing to go get a refi our house if we need to do that to see this church happen. Mm. It's incredible. And then I knew they were in with all their heart. They put it on the line. Can you believe that? Amen. How could I say no? Yeah. Mm. yeah. So good. Yeah. And so you moved your family out yeah. and you started in the A-frame at Skyline. Mm. And then from there, I know that there's a journey that you took to be in the center of town. So you moved the church to the Hungry Tiger in a restaurant. <laughs> And from there, I know there was some uh, road bumps because there was so much growth. And then you started a church in a warehouse. That was unheard of back then. And then God put you on a journey to be in this space. Yep. Can you tell us that journey, Larry? Well, when I came, there's a little A-frame church on, in Skyline Drive. Do you, you know where that is? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was our church. And I said, I went out with the chamber, chamber of commerce director the first week I was here, spent the whole evening with him, who was a non-church guy, and just asked him all kinds of questions about understanding the community. And uh, so I talked to him about maybe meeting at that place. He said, well, I don't know, go talk. So I did. We went and arranged to meet at the Hungry Tiger. And uh, so the night before we were supposed to start the church, first service, or two days before, I guess it was, he called me, the director of the Chambers of Commerce, and said, there's going to be a scandal in town, that restaurant's being shut down this weekend, they're not paying their bills, and the city's taking over the place, it's going to be the biggest scandal in town. And he said, I guess you've got free advertising. Do you still want to meet? I said, why not? So we went, the lights weren't on, the heat wasn't on, but we opened anyhow. We started that way. But we got free advertising without paying. It's marvelous. It was wonderful. That's sort of how it started. So we went from there to uh, three years later, a neighbor of yours who who ran that restaurant there, came to me after service. We were doing two services then and a lot of people there. And he came to me and said, uh, with due respect, Pastor, we, Pastor DeWitt, we got a reverend, I guess he called me, whatever. And he said, uh, you can't, you gotta go. Well, what, what are we doing wrong? You know, and he said, nothing you're doing wrong. You know, what the wrong is, there's a parking lot out there and there's no place for people to park and come to a restaurant. You're gonna have to leave. So we had about, few weeks to do something. I said, let's search, what, what? And somebody came up, well, there's some new warehouses in Westlake Village, and that's how that came about. Hmm. And, uh, and even Christianity Today wrote this, another friend of mine in New York did the same thing, and they wrote this article about these crazy churches that were going in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. Well, why not? You build, people would ask me, I had thousands of people ask me, when are you gonna build a church? I say, uh, you mean a building? The church is the people. Right. So uh, that was an interesting thing, but that, that triggered, a, how many work, warehouse churches in America now? That I think that sort of started here. Did you know that? It started here and they're all over the place mm -hmm. now. But God did things like that, and then the warehouse, we didn't have enough. There were 40 parking spaces, Yeah. and nine or I ten, remember. 900 people come three times on Sunday. Well, tell me where, they, I don't know where they parked, all over here, right? but, <laughs> but they came anyhow, in spite of that, they came. Yeah, but some, we just believed for something new to happen, and eventually that was when the mayor, invited me out for lunch and said, I want to show you this. He showed me this building. He said, it's been sitting here two years. The city would like it if it could get occupied. And uh, so could you use that for a church? And that was the start. So we came here and looked at all of that and said, it's crazy. And people thought, people stared me in the face and got mad at me and left the church. Said, Are you crazy? This is nuts. And, and uh, I really almost lost my life, I guess, a few times. But people were really upset about that. And we finally, we entered into a rescue for that and said, you'll never be able to do it. And the day the escrow was to close was the day of the San Fernando Valley, what? Northridge. Northridge, Northridge earthquake. earthquake. We lost the church. Not you know to the else? earthquake. Not the earthquake. The, this, not this. We lost our hopes of having this for a home. This church, this, this is the strongest building in town. You know that? Yes. Built by, Neta, uh, you don't know this, but built by the U.S. government. Uh, this was a West Coast operation for the Pentagon. You didn't know that, did you? 
This used to be for swords and warfare, and now it's for peace in God. Can you believe it? Yes. That's why we're here. Yes. So, so, so anyhow, out of that, when we lost our home, we lost our dream for a ho new home. We'd been waiting 20 years for a place, and we were said, now what? And we just said, you can't give up your dream and your hope. And we didn't. So when you get a setback in your life, do you let go of your hope? That's a really foolish thing to do. You know that? It just doesn't make any sense. So every time we drive by here, Becky would say, that's going to be a Christian high school. And I'd say, that's going to be our church someday. And it was four years later when it finally happened that we had that. And, and God opened this place. So when you go through trials in your life, that just refines you so you can be ready for more. Hmm. Enough. The okay. move. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is... This is Palm Sunday, and 25 years ago on Palm Sunday was this amazing opportunity wow. for the congregation. You'd purchased the building, started in 98, remodeling, mm -hmm. and you're going to make the march across from the old, where you were at the time, to here. Talk about what happened 25 years ago on Palm Sunday. When Becky and I were newlyweds, we were sitting, living in Jerusalem, lived on the Mount of Olives, looking down on the Garden of Gethsemane, studying archaeology, and it was a very moving experience for us to do that. And one morning we woke up, and there was a lot of noise out there, and we went outside in the street in front of us going down into the city, was lined with people, throwing their, their clothes on the street and waving palm branches and cheering, and I didn't, couldn't figure out what was happening. And then King Hussein drove in his Mercedes to the city of Jerusalem. And I'll never forget the power of thinking what Palm Sunday really means. Mm -hmm. The king's coming. So when this was all going on here, Jeremiah, Joshua 3 was on my mind that, that the, the children of Israel were praying for a new home. We were praying for 20 years for a new home. Couldn't get it. But we never gave up. And uh, so when they crossed the Jordan River, the Jordan and came into Jer Jericho, this was finally an answer. And I said, that's what we're doing. We've been waited, waiting a long time to cross over. So that road out there is uh, the Jordan River. <laughs> We had a police escort and all. We had this big celebration and a parade all the way over here. All kinds of things, but a lot of fun, and it was a great parade. But that's what we were celebrating. Yeah. God is finally giving us a home. Mm, so good. So you let's did, go back. Go ahead. Right, no. I was going to say, so let's go back 25 years, a week from today. Well, Friday. It's good Friday. I know that you were talking to the head of construction, Jax Carroll. You had some <clears throat> conversation with him. How'd that go? It was not a good conversation. <laughs> He said, uh, well, with due respect, when, when they give you that, you know it's trouble. Uh -huh. With due respect, Pastor. Uh, now, this, what he does with you is a, a week or two before yeah. that Good Friday. Oh, two or three weeks yeah, later, he yeah. said, you need to know, we're not going to be there for Easter. It cannot happen. Right. So what do you mean it can't happen? It can't happen. I'm telling you, it can't happen. Well, yeah. now that we know that, it's time to pray for a miracle. Hmm. So I said, fine. I walked away. He said, well, come on. It's not going to happen. And on Good Friday... Out here was the fire department chief for L.A. County and some other people from our building team and all outside walking around, walked through the building. We were in the lobby here waiting for hours. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, on Good Friday, which we celebrated the time Christ said it's finished, the director of construction walked in and said, it's finished. We're going to be here for Easter tomorrow. And that week, weekend, five services, I guess, and masses of people. But what you, you pointed out to me was there were 3,000 people who wouldn't have got in if we hadn't been in this building. And that morning was uh, just God broke through, the Holy Spirit broke through this place. And people were naysayers saying, you'll never fill that building. I looked and there's all these people. Right. And uh, How many came to Christ that first Easter 25 years ago? Well, I did a thing that not few pastors would do. When everybody walked in, you're welcoming thousands of people. They all got a nice big spike like this. What? That was their Easter present. And the message that morning was about crucified and crowned, Christ crucified and crowned. And I said, take out your spike. Who crucified Jesus? They gave a sermon about that. And I said, just hold that right here. I did. He died because of my sins. And God broke through with that. And that morning, uh, I don't know, 170 people signed afterward and said, yes, I made a commitment to Christ. I want to be discipled and follow him. Mm -hmm. And I just met a man outside at, yeah. right now who came up to me and pulled out something from his neck and said, there's the spike you gave me no way. 25 wow. years ago. Wow. I wear it every day as a wow. reminder. Yeah. Christ died for my sins. So awesome. Great. <clears throat> Thank you.
Well, Sean, you and Larry have a lot in common, but one interesting fact that I think not many people know is that Calvary originally invited each of you to be an advisor to finding Calvary's next senior pastor, when in fact, each of you became Calvary's next senior pastor, which I love that Good story, luck, but would love to hear more of the journey that God put you and Leslie on to bring, coming here. Yeah, we were uh, in Charleston, West Virginia. God had allowed me to become the senior pastor of a sizable church there at the age of 29. God grew that church as people came to Jesus and were baptized and joined in the effort of of spreading his kingdom and, and his gospel in that community and around the world. And things were going well. We'd outgrown the campus we were on, and we bought a new piece of property and built a new building, and things were going great. Matter of fact, we got down to the pulpit, uh, was kind of built to my height, and it was kind of like a glove that had been made for me, a, like a baseball player's glove, and it fit. And I thought I'd be there the rest of my life. Things were going well. And I was on the board of Awana Clubs International. One of the elders here at Calvary was on that board, asked to start praying for the church because there had been a pastor between Larry and me for a couple of years, and that pastor had uh, failed, and there was brokenness here. People left. Uh, the staff was cut as well as... Am I cutting out? I think so. Am I, is it, am I doing this? Um, the um, staff had been cut. Just It was a really tough time with right. budgeting and everything. And... Um, John showed me this document. He said, this is kind of going to be shaping what we're looking for in a new senior pastor, just philosophically. What do you think? And he let me speak into it. And then he, they started asking me for maybe some candidates in the southeast part of the United States. This is back in 2008, asking me for uh, per potential uh, candidates. And I gave them some names. And then they said, would you like to come out and uh, be a guest speaker to thank me for some of that input, but also there were hints then of maybe they would want to consider me, but Leslie and I were very comfortable where we were, and uh, we came uh, just to be the guest speaker, and as I spoke that uh, July 20th, 2008, here in this room, when I got into the lobby, God started doing something in my heart. I sensed that the people here were hurting from what they'd gone through. Some of you remember that season. And they were hungry, though, for something new and fresh, for God to do a new work. They were hungry for God's truth and for a fresh glimpse of Jesus, a move of God's spirit. And I could sense that. And so something began to change in my heart and began to adjust. And we had all these uh, hurdles in our minds that would have to be overcome for us to leave a place where we felt like we were thriving and growing and our kids were doing great. And uh, then that day, I had asked if I could have lunch with Larry and Becky just to hear that original vision, the heart of what was Calvary originally? What was the passion and heartbeat? And they were so gracious to have lunch with me that day, and I appreciated that. Um, gave you were it. gracious to invite me to do that. Nobody else who came in Canada did that. But it said a whole lot to me about you, that you were coming to understand this place and lead it forward rather than coming to do your own thing. Yeah, it's very kind. Thank the Lord. Yeah. 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 For your very heart. Kind. You opened it. And since that day forward, um, Larry has always been in my camp as an encourager and cheerleader, and uh, I've appreciated that. And that's rare with a founder to be able to do that and let go, and he's done that so well and blessed me. But that, that day we left, and we were kind of like, uh-oh, God's doing something here, but there's still all these hurdles. And the next day, uh, the chairman of the board at the time was Rick Fusilier, who now joined our staff and is uh, our stewardship pastor. You saw him on the video. He called me to say, hey, the elders would love for you to come and now officially candidate. And uh, Leslie and I prayed about it said, what would it hurt? And I'd had some advice that sometimes when you're in a season where you've had a lot of growth and you've moved to a new campus, God will have you go do interviews, but then you come back and it's just a recalling you to that spot. So I believe that was what was happening. We wow. kind of rationalized it that way and said, certainly we'll come, but we're not committing to anything. Two weeks later, I came and spoke again and God stirred more in our hearts. And then Rick called on behalf of the elders and said, uh, we're, we're really wanting to invite you to come and be our pastor. Would you pray about that? And we prayed about it, and God removed all those hurdles. And we mourned leaving where we were. We have great relationships there still today. But uh, God brought us here. And since then, we've had a front row seat of watching God rebirth the heart of a church. And it wasn't easy. Matter of fact, you mentioned you were 40 and said that uh, you had mentioned in the other service that... Uh, 
that Becky thought maybe this could be a midlife crisis. You Absolutely. Know. And, yeah. and my <laughs> wife thought the same thing, and others thought the same thing. Um, and as we think about him... midlife crisis. Yeah. So I, I woke up in the middle of the night, those first t- couple of years here at Calvary, and I'd wake up and think, oh, no, what if this was a midlife crisis? And I'm uh, not where God wants me to be. Now, he has no idea what I'm talking about or what he's talking about. You'll get he there. hasn't even had his quarter-life crisis yet. Um, <laughs> But then just to watch as God opened the hearts of people and yeah. God began to change. and when it, it, It's amazing yeah. to see what God has done and to have that front row seat. Yeah, and the timing of you coming, though, wasn't ideal. No, as a matter of fact, my first day in the office was September 15, 2008. After about 18 months of a lot of brokenness and pain, my first day was the day the stock market crashed and started the Great Recession. <laughs> and uh, so we still had a lot to do that was complicated and made it more difficult. And look, at that moment, it probably didn't seem that way. But looking back, I see that as God's providence and his sovereignty, bringing you and partnering with Pastor Curtis Johnson to bring stability to our church and calming us down and putting, bringing us back to a place of health and growth. It was incredible. And I know you invited me to serve as an elder on the elder board. And I remember you guys coming in with a compelling 2020 vision at the time. Yeah. It was remarkable. As you look back on that season of ministry, what surprised you most that God did? Well, what, what surprised me, first of all, is how God brought vision to life. And it wasn't about just how we organize things or our schemes or thoughts. Or It was really watching God do a work. This verse that, of Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, it says in the midst of this verse, if it talks about now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, now notice this, that is at work within us. Mm-hmm. If, I, if I go back to 2011, 2012, we cast that vision. We wanted to see certain things happen. We wanted to give away 20% of everything that came into Calvary's offerings to help people in need in our congregation, our community, reaching out to our community, and even reaching out to the world with the gospel. We wanted to share our faith with 20 people, all of us, and to hear some people say, hey, I shared about Jesus for the first time with a neighbor. just brought great joy to my heart. And then we had an emphasis that we want to engage 20% of the greater Caneo Valley. It was wonderful to watch as God gave us new opportunities and open doors we didn't even no existed, but over what, what really was at the heart of all that is God's power working, and this is in the present continuous, being at work continuously in us. He was working in me, he was working in so many of us, and then through God's work in our hearts and lives, what God did through all of us together was just truly a work of God and can wow. be only for the glory of Jesus Christ and seeing what happened. So it's a beautiful thing to see that happen. I just want to invite those of you on this, this Palm Sunday, I want to remind you that uh, on Palm Sunday, when that, that occasion when Jesus came into uh, Jerusalem the week before uh, his his crucifixion, he comes in and they hail him as king and sing praises to him and welcome him. As you said, you saw King Hussein being welcomed in. That uh, that. That was a crowd that later would cry, crucify him. They really didn't have a personal relationship for God to be at work in their hearts until many of them would come to Jesus later. But I want to invite you not just to see Jesus as an external uh, person or idea or religion or concept, but to have a personal relationship with Jesus so God can be working in your heart. The scriptures uh, tell us that Jesus died. As you mentioned, he died for our sins, suffered for our sins. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. Uh, now is ascended with the Father, and that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we can all have a relationship with God. That's where the work of God in us starts. And I would encourage you, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, to do that so you can be his child, have a relationship with him now, meet the Lord today, and know him now and forever. Uh, Any one of us would love to share that with you in the lobby afterwards. Uh, You can speak to our care team. We'll be down front. But make sure you know that God is in your life because God can't work in and through you unless you know him as your savior, not just as some external idea or person, but you know him personally. And so when I saw what happened back then, I saw God working in us together, and we saw God bring that vision to life. So great. And as we're in this season now, what are some of the things that you see now that God is doing? What are some of those opportunities? What are some of those areas that we need to enhance and improve? I'm very excited about our 2030 vision that Brian and I are leading. As we've talked about, as we get closer to 2030, he and I will switch roles, and he'll become the senior pastor. I'll become the teaching slash associate pastor. Um, I'm going to be on staff in the key leadership for years to come, so please stop asking me when I'm retiring. Uh, It's not for 10 or 15 years. 
uh, but we'll switch roles and I'll be a part of the leadership and have other responsibilities and be a part of the team and I'm looking forward to that. But in the 2030 vision, there are great opportunities to reach our community and our world and the next generation for Jesus and I'm passionate about that. But it also means we've got some hurdles right now. You know, I mentioned a few weeks ago we've had a 200% growth in the area of our special abilities ministry. 200% growth. That's in the last six months, that's a lot of families that we get to minister to, and it's a privilege and honor, but that's putting some stress on, on our campus. This is a wonderful tool. Thank you, and thank you to the giants with you who took that step of faith to come here and those that are even here today because you have uh, given our generation into the next generation a wonderful tool to reach this community for Christ, but we might have to add some things to this tool, repurpose some things to reach more of those special abilities families. When it comes to Young families with preschoolers, our early childhood between zero and four, has grown 67% on the weekends in the last six months. That's a great opportunity to reach those families, but we're running out of space for them. And even our day preschool we started two years ago is growing, and, and we could expand it, but we need to redo some rooms or add some rooms to be able to do that. So there's some challenges there. Again, this is a great tool uh, the main part of this building was built, as he said, as a defense contracting firm in 1968. Yeah. This area was the only part that was collapsed and that Calvary built uh, 25 years ago as the worship center. So we've got parts of the building have some needs, even this room after 25 years. Our sound system, we spent a lot of dollars and we're using Band-Aids because the sound system speakers and all the different parts to it are 25 years old and it's getting harder to keep it up and it's, a, it's, it's become a real challenge. We're spending a lot of money to just keep up the current system, so we're gonna have to make that decision to enhance sure. the sound system in this room uh, so that we can continue forward in the next generation. Yeah. So there's some challenges around those kinds of things. There's a great opportunity with a, with a hope center that will reach out into our community we've been talking about, yeah. and these things are, are right on the forefront of our thoughts, and we believe God is gonna be able to do way beyond, yeah. immeasurably yeah. beyond, what we can ask or imagine in the days ahead. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It'd be wonderful yeah. to watch what God does. Yeah. Well, Pastor Brian, you and I both started here as interns. Yep. We both met our future wives interning here at Calvary. Can yep. you share a little bit more about the journey that God put you on bringing here to Calvary? Yeah, the first time I was ever introduced to Calvary Community Church was the fall of 2007. I was a sophomore in college, um, and the current high school pastor now here at our church, Drew Walton, was in college with me um, and invited me to come up here to lead a high school small group on Tuesday nights during college. And so, so you were here one year before me. That's right, 2007, wow. yeah. So You were 10 years old. I, yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> they, they let me in. Um, he drove. Um, but... But, but it was a couple of years of leading a small group, and then I was coming toward graduation in May of 2010 and knew I wanted to go into ministry, knew that's where God was calling me, and I had applied to about a dozen churches all over California, and I've shared this before, but I heard back from exactly zero of them. Um, so things were not going very well at all in that number, and then was invited to consider an internship here at Calvary, and, and took that internship and came that summer, and, and really came into Calvary a little bit jaded against large churches. You know, it had nothing to do with Calvary or my experience here. Just my own bias was that large churches didn't love uh, the Lord properly. They didn't know the word. Uh, it was all about numbers or size or show. Uh, and, and I came here to Calvary that summer and was just incredibly humbled right away uh, by meeting people in our congregation who knew and loved the Bible more than I ever did, by meeting people who were faithful to Jesus and sacrificial toward him. It, it was an incredible thing to see a church that truly was living and loving like Jesus. Yes. And I was blown away in summer of 2010. And so um, ended up staying here, and, and through the course of that summer, uh, as you mentioned, Pastor Jason met a, a woman named Danny German at the time, uh, who had grown up here at the church, and a couple of years later, we were married and have had three kids, uh, and our entire marriage and adult life has been right here at Calvary, uh, raising those kids, building our family, and, and serving here at the church. And so uh, spent about a decade in our student ministries, high school ministry, and middle school ministry, and, and our young adults ministry. And I've gotten to see God do some incredible things and, and just continue to be grateful for a church like Calvary uh, that has in every way shown itself to be generous and kind and good and faithful mm -hmm. and above all a church that is focused and has set its eyes on Jesus. Amen. It's wonderful. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And Brian, as you look 
at the 2030 vision and beyond and yeah. think about this, this passage in Ephesians 3, 20, 21, what excites you most about what God is yeah. doing and what he will be doing? Yeah, you know, this passage we've been looking at all morning says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more yep. than all we ask or imagine according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And then I love this part of the verse. It says, throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. And there's something beautiful to the fact that Paul is writing this letter under the direction of the Spirit of God to the church in Ephesus just a few decades after Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. There were only a few thousand Christians at this time, and he has the boldness in God's Spirit to say, God is going to continue to show himself to be glorious in his church for all generations, forever and ever, until Christ returns. And that was an incredibly bold and faith-filled statement. And yet the beautiful thing for us to see in 2024 is that for 20 centuries, God has showed himself to be faithful to the words you see up on the screen. He has showed himself to be strong all over the world so that at this point, we celebrate today as a church, we recognize who Jesus is along with billions of brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world. God has shown himself to be faithful in every generation forever and ever, and it's a remarkable to th see that in the global church. And then for us here at Calvary, I think we get the opportunity to see that that has happened at our church generation after generation that as long as this church has been around god has shown himself to be faithful to us and god shows his faithfulness through people who are willing to serve and pastor larry that that begins with you mm -hmm. and so i think today we as a church honor you for mm -hmm. your love for the local church your love for the lost and those mm -hmm. far from god your desire to see god do something incredible in our time and in our season and today as we celebrate and honor all god has done today we honor you and how god has been faithful through you. It's all about him. It's all about the Lord. Thank you. And, and then as we think about how those generations have gone, Pastor Sean, we, we, we honor you. And we honor what God has done in your leadership here at Calvary, your obvious love for God and, and the way that has shaped you as a man and as a father and a husband and a pastor. We see the way you love this church and shepherd so well. You care about the sheep and you care about the flock that God has under your care. We know your love for the word and how you have taught it faithfully since the moment you first stood in this pulpit. It's been an incredible thing to see the generation that you have raised up and continue to lead forward in here at this church. And we as a church honor you, Pastor Sean, for being faithful in your generation. Thank you. And, and then as we look forward to 2030 and think about what God has ahead of us as a church, the charge for all of us is that we would continue that faithful legacy that's 20 centuries old, that here at this church is 48 years old, of faithful gospel witness, of loving the Lord and trusting his word, that we would continue to do that on and on and on. I think about our 2030 sort of core statements, that we want to be a church that deliberately elevates our love for God's word, that this here at Calvary is a church that loves the word of God. We love the Bible, and yet we want to elevate that over the years. We want to be a place that dramatically escalates our Christ-like compassion. In a world full of hatred and anger and division and conflict, we want to be a people of peace, a people of compassion, whose compassion is shaped not by the world's idea of compassion, but by the model and the example that Jesus gave to us. We want to see that escalate over the years. And then finally, we say that we want to decisively empower our next generation, that we want to look to the generation that comes after us, even as the psalmist says, to the generations not yet born. And our desire as a church is in the next 50 years, years, if the Lord does not come and return, we want to be a church that continues to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, raised for our salvation, and reigning over all things. Calvary, we have a remarkable history, and yet because the Spirit of God is working in us, we can confidently say that our best days, what God wants to do, are ahead of us. We are excited for who God is and what he's doing, and we're going to stay faithful, and God is going to show himself to be strong. Yeah. 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 I, I trust uh, you sense just the incredible opportunity for the three of us, as uh, Brian just mentioned, while there are incredible days of God's good hand on Calvary Community Church, until Jesus comes, I think there are greater days even ahead for us to step out by faith and see God do some big things 
that are beyond what we could ask or imagine. And uh, so grateful for Pastor Larry and how he has uh, been such an encouragement to me and encouraging our generation continues to be that for he and Becky. So grateful for Brian. Look forward to the time when I'll serve under his leadership and worship uh, under his leadership and what we're going to see God do in the years to come as as he leads us forward and, and the blessing that he and Danny will be to our congregation as we move forward. This is a great opportunity mm -hmm. for us to celebrate the good hand of our God mm -hmm. and all praise and glory goes to Jesus Christ. Yep. Amen. Yep. Amen. And we want all praise and glory to go to him. And I trust that in your own walk with him, you're trusting him for things that are beyond what you can even yeah. ask or imagine because yeah. he'll do immeasurably beyond that in our lives too. So amen, amen, amen. Well, Pastor Larry, this is also a very special weekend for you as you are celebrating a birthday. You're kidding. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, you've given me permission to let everybody know you are now turned 87 years old. <laughs> How'd that happen? How'd that happen? I don't know. And in a tradition that you gave to us years ago to celebrate Happy Birthday Jesus with Cake, we would love to sing happy birthday to you as a congregation. Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Larry. Happy birthday to you. It is. It is a happy birthday. Thank you. Go it on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Keep trying. So much fun. Well, I know there's a lot of people that want to spend time with you after the service in the lobby. Pastor Larry and Becky will be right out against the 25th anniversary wall. You can purchase a book at the bookstore right next to it, or just come up and give them a quick hug. I know there's a lot of people last service that came up to you and want to talk with you, and there's hundreds of people, so we'll have to move that quickly. We'll do our absolute best, but if you want to pick this up, as, as um, Pastor Michael was sharing, it is. It's the philosophy of ministry that birthed Calvary Community Church. And you wrote this years ago, but then there's some parts of this that you've added in. So this is a more recent book. I know that people ask, is this an older book? And sort of, it came from parts of your dissertation years ago. So I know there's a lot of thought and heart and energy that went into this. So I'd invite you to be a part of that. And then for those of us afterwards, in the spirit of asking people to come hear the good news of Jesus Christ and making much of Jesus, we'd encourage you to grab a card, an invitation in the lobby, invite a friend, invite two friends, invite yeah. three friends that need to hear Ooh, Jesus yeah. Christ and his personal saving work in their lives this coming Easter. Please do that this weekend. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, each one of you, for your faithfulness you to the call of ministry on your lives. It's incredible. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to invite up our wives, my wife Jenny, Larry's wife Becky, Pastor Sean's wife Leslie, and Brian Howard's wife Danny, to come up and pray with us. And I've invited Rick Bartlett, the chairman of the elders, to pray over Calvary Community Church and its future. What a special day. You know, it's incredible uh, that we have the opportunity to celebrate 25 years in this building. Um, if you think about how profound it is, how many people, how many thousands of people have come to know Jesus on this campus and have grown closer to our Lord just by virtue of being able to worship here. Um, it's incredible. It's mind-blowing if you think about the impact that all those people have in God's kingdom. But what's truly amazing is that we have the opportunity to, to, to celebrate this way because of the men, the godly men who love the Lord, who God has given us to lead this church. You know, the real special sauce here, uh, the thing that, that I think you all got a glimpse of this morning is how much these men love each other and how much they admire and respect each other. It's truly um, a unique opportunity uh, in any organization to have that kind of dynamic, to have uh, three generations of leaders who are able and love to speak into each other's lives and, and, and pastor each other. Uh, and it's truly, guys, it is truly an honor to call each one of you pastor. Thank God for you. 
And we are truly blessed as a church to have these men in our lives. So let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for this church, Lord. I thank you for the so many ways that, you, that your hand has been so obviously upon Calvary. God, I thank you for the men on this stage. I thank you for the way that you have equipped them, uh, the way that you have gifted them, the way that you have called them, or the way that they love their congregation, the way that they shepherd us, the way that they teach your word so clearly and so passionately. So Lord, as we stand here with them, we pray that you would continue to guide them, protect them. We thank you for the, the wives that, that you have given them, that love them and support them so. And Lord, we pray that we would all support them uh, as our pastors, God. And now that as, as we stand here, we pray that you would, you would keep your hand on Calvary, that you would make us bold, Lord, that you would make us an impactful church for your kingdom, knowing that, uh, that, that you can do immeasurably more than all that we can ever ask for or imagine, God. And that it's your power that is within us, working in us. And that it will be that you will have all the glory forever and ever, Lord. So help us as we go forward. Proclaim your glory boldly. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.